I'm Glover Davis. I was 21 and had just served a three-year enlistment in the Navy when I took my first class from Philip Levine. My only previous writing experience consisted of sports stories for the Santa Cruz Sentinel. I had a spotty academic record in high school and there were others like me in Phil's classes, but he took us all seriously. Phil was the kind of teacher I had never seen before. He'd come into a classroom, maybe tired, maybe irritated by some of the things he had to endure. And of course, he had flaws the way we all do. But time after time, I saw this change come over him, call it grace or inspiration, whatever it was. And he'd speak with clarity and power. It seemed at those times that he was more than what he was. And the quote, Phil, quote, he told the truth as it was given him to see the truth no matter what. And you never knew what he might say in response to a student's work. I once wrote a poem that began, I love the dust, oil, and roar of German tiger tanks pressing Europe with terror. I brought it to class, having written it out of my interest in military history, and was not focusing on the Nazis' horrific crimes against humanity. My fellow classmates thought I was going to really get it. But Phil said, this poem's honest. The Germans had those snappy uniforms, and France had a corrupt socialism that let the Spanish Republic die. Phil also defended our right to make ascetic choices. I once wrote a poem on iambic pentameter quatrains with rhyme that the avant-garde students in the class did not like. <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> Phil urged them, try listening to the poem, to its rhythms. He said this even though in his own work he was beginning to move toward those free verse poems using anaphora and parallel phrases, powerful poems that I would later teach and quote. Of course, his defense of my right to work within the formal tradition didn't keep Phil from critique. Years later, he once addressed a letter to me as Glover I am Davis. Because of the quality of Phil's teaching, many of his students were admitted to the University of Iowa's Writers' Workshop, which in those days was the most distinguished program of its kind. There were five of us from Fresno State when I went there in 1964, more than any other university. Reflecting on our training under Phil, Harry Duncan, the great typographer, remarked, that the Fresno poets were like Marines back from the South Pacific. <laughs> because of my degree from Iowa and some poems that I had revised and polished under Phil's guidance and published in the Southern Review and other places, I was able to get a teaching job at San Diego State. We had to teach four courses a semester in those years, and two of those courses would be English composition. One time in May, when the school year was over, I drove up to Fresno to see Phil. We drank this Spanish brandy for three days and three nights, washing out the kind of fatigue that comes from too much teaching. We talked about everything. It was a great three days. Fran would come in and with a slightly amused smile shake her head and go on about her business. At the end last year, I got to say goodbye to Phil. And tell him how much he meant to me. 
We spent a few minutes alone in the room where he lay too weak to sit up. I told him my Mariana was a great wife, and he said, bring her in. We chatted for a couple of minutes. As Phil was upbeat, doing his best. <sighs> what the heck? <laughs> Mariana mentioned that we just saw a, saw a documentary on Mel Brooks, and both of us were surprised how much he sounded like Phil. The same timing to his humor, and some of the same cadences that Phil had. I asked Phil, did you ever give Mel Brooks any pointers? <laughs> Phil didn't miss a beat. Hell no! He never offered me enough money. <laughs> it's fitting that my last memory of Phil is laughter. I miss him a lot.